We've got a number which is apparently so famous that it's up there on the mathematical constants list, uh, up there with pi and e and root two. But this one I'd never heard of until recently. And apparently, well, they're pretty sure it's irrational. So I'm just going to give you the first bit of it. This is Feigenbaum's constant, or one of Feigenbaum's constants. There's another one. If you find references to two of them, I'm not going to talk about the second one, which has a simple alpha. There was a paper in, I think, 1970-odd uh, by Robert May about a, an equation, which I'm going to write down, uh, which models population growth. Uh, X, so it's traditional, and this is going to be like a population level. And it's a way of modeling like how things breed, so maybe rabbits or frogs. Let's, let's go with rabbits, because they breed like, uh, yeah, rabbits. Uh, it's going to have some other variables in it. This is what they call the logistic map. Map is like a posh word for a function. You get an input and output and it's mapping one value to another one. But what this does is it, it predicts what the next year's population is going to be for a community of animals. The first component here is the next year population. So that means this one here is the uh, previous. And so we're just, we're, we're kind of counting populations. They're going to be between zero and one, like empty dead population and a full population. And that's what this number is as well. So we've got like we're going to iterate this. We're going to get an answer out and put it back in to get the next year's thing. And then the important number here is this, this lambda. So it's like the fertility. So like if this is high, these things are going to breed like, like, like rabbits. And if it's, if it's zero, they're not going to breed at all. And changing this number is what the biologists were using to sort of model different populations. If the previous year's population is high, you'd expect the next one to be high. So you're kind of multiplying by the previous year's population. But also if it's too high, they're going to run out of food. So that's where you do one minus the previous population. So this is like the breeding and this is like starvation. What's interesting is you, you can just put numbers into this. So I'm, I'm going to start with a population x1 of a half. So remember this is going to is between 0 and 1. The population is half full to start with. You, in fact, you can start with anything. What's interesting is what happens over a long time. So we need to choose a fertility. I'm going to choose, just for this particular example, lambda the fertility to be, I don't know. It turns out you need to be between 0 and 4. There are, there are complicated reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into right now. But I'm going to choose 2.3. So it's, we're about middle in our range of fertility. So it, this calculation tells me that the next year's population has gone up. I've got 0.575. So my population has increased. I've got enough fertility that the, the breeding is happening well. What's interesting, though, is what happens over a long time. For year 3, we get... 0.562. The population dropped. Yeah, the population's dropped. So we've clearly gone high enough that the competition started kicking in and, and maybe they can't sustain that high population. What's interesting though is if you, uh, you, if you wonder, how, is this going to bounce lots of times? And actually typing this in every time is, is extraordinarily tedious. Although I know you're watching uh, this for exactly that reason. But we could speed this up and you can do it on any of these calculators because it has an iteration function. If I clear this and I type 2.3 times answer, Whatever the previous answer was is going to turn up there, and then one minus answer. And then I, don't, I never have to type anything in again, which is my idea of maths. Uh, so next year, I'm not going to write them down anymore, but next year X4 will get 0.566. It's, oh. it's gone up. And if I keep pressing equals, I'm not going to read them out anymore, but keep an eye on what's happening. I'm just going to keep pressing equals. 0 0.56494, 0 0.565, 0 0.56519, 0 0.56522, 0 0.56522. 0 0.56522, 0 0.56522, okay, you know what's going to happen. It looks like, actually, and this is believable, right? Sometimes populations stabilise. And this is good because this is the real world being described by a simple equation. This is not all that exciting, I have to say, but, but at least I can do this calculation repeatedly. I can bash the button as many times as I like, and it's, it's not changing anymore. It's genuinely doing the calculation, but it's giving the same answer. It's what they call a fixed point of the iteration. So the rabbits are breeding, uh, but they're also dying, and they're dying and breeding at the same rate, and something's balanced. Um, and this is good because the biologists needed to, a simple way of modeling real populations, and real populations do balance out eventually. What's nice about this is this map or this function or this equation is that it also manages to capture some more complicated behavior, which is what happens if you change our lambda number, which is, I think, what we should do now. I won't write all the calculations, but I can show you on my calculator what happens if you change lambda. I'm going to do a, a lower fertility, um, and I'm going to do this quickly because I think you might be able to predict what happens if we have less fertile rabbits. Uh, so I'm actually going to, I'm going to reset my population to be a half. I'm going to be 0 0.5 and press equals and store that as the previous answer. I'm just going to type in now, a uh, we'll do a lambda of, do you want to pick a lambda between 0 and 1, Brady? Can we have 0.65? We can have 0.65, I'll do 0.65. So we started at half, after one year we have a population of 0.1625. Your rabbits are dying. But if I keep pressing it, obviously I can now just keep pressing it to see what happens. Uh, 0 0.08, 0 0.05, 0 0.03, this is not looking good. I'm just going to go for it now. 
0.009.0006. Eventually my calculator is going to say, look, stop pressing equals, they're all dead. In fact, I'm now at zero. And maybe it's not quite zero, but it's off the end of the accuracy I care about. I killed the rabbits. Yeah. Well, and again, useful to a sort of heartless biologist to model sometimes populations die out. What happens in the wild, though, is that sometimes populations die and sometimes they're stable and sometimes they do funky things. Um, and it kind of surprised them that they could get the funky things. So one funky thing, if I pick a higher fertility, so I'm going to set up my population to be a half, 0 0.5 equals, that's the, the first answer gone in. And then I'm going to use lambdas 3.2 this time. So clear this, 3.2 times the previous population times 1 minus the previous population. And uh, this time we started at half, after one year, we've got 0.8. Population's gone up, no big surprise, fertile rabbit. Next year, well there's lots of them now, so you know, the competition kicks in next year, 0.51. It's dropped way back down to almost where we started. Well, too many rabbits, you know, there's not enough grass. Uh, or the foxes are like, well, hey, <laughs> rabbit season, and they've ate. And, and I realise we're not counting foxes in this thing, but somehow this is capturing the behaviour that populations go up, and then they quite often drop suddenly if there's too many. If I press equals again, we're at 0.79. It's gone back up again. Definitely feels like we've got a bit of a bouncy behaviour, and it's believable, but if I keep pressing equals 0 0.51, 0 0.79, 0 0.51, 0 0.79, in fact, I'm going to press it a few times, it might like take a bit of catching up, but if I slow down in a moment, 0 0.51304, 0 0.79946, 0 0.51304, 0 0.79946. It's not changing, except it is changing every year, but it's not changing between these two values. And so it's stabilised. We've got what they call a fixed point, but it's not just one fixed point. We have a two cycle. Like a yo-yo fixed point. Yeah, exactly. And, and if you drew a graph of it, you'd see it bounce up and down. And it might be interesting to draw some graphs of this in a moment because, in fact, I'll, I'll draw you a graph. The first behaviour we had was, was rabbits doing this, stabilising. And then the next behaviour had was rabbits dying. And then we've just seen something else can happen. And it happens out there in the real world is that you start somewhere and it sort of bounces up here and then down and, the, and then it... But it doesn't stabilise ever, it keeps bouncing like this. Uh, the, the reason this map is being used, this function is being used, is that it's capturing even more complicated behaviours than just life and death. So we've got life, but uh, high population, ah, oh, too many rabbits, so they kind of die off, but next year there's loads of space for them, so they grow again and then they bounce. I'm going to pick lambda to be, this is a carefully chosen value, I'm going to pick it to be 3.5, let's try that one. I'm going to set the population to be a half, 3.5 is lambda, multiplied by the previous population, multiplied by 1 minus the previous population. This time it goes up to 0 0.875, 0 0.38, 0 0.82, 0 0.50. Wait, these are all different. I'm just going to keep pressing it. But it's definitely not settling down. I'll show you, I'll show you what's happening on the screen. We've got 0 0.5, 0 0.87, 0 0.38, 0 0.82, 0 0.5, 0 0.87, 0 0.38, 0 0.82. Actually, it is cycling, but it's not two. It's now four. And so if I drew a graph of this one, this time it's going sort of down, up, down, down a bit further, up a bit further, and then down, up, down a bit further, up a bit further. So actually we've got a, we've got a four cycle. At this point, like doing this on a calculator becomes a bit of a waste of time. But what the biologists were doing with a computer was saying, okay, even complicated behavior like a, a, a four year cycle of populations can be modeled by this with still just this one parameter, this one fertility thing. And that surprised them. Uh, what they didn't know was about to happen was what happens if you go above 3.5, because no one ever did, because it looked like it didn't do anything useful. If you change lambda beyond roughly 3.59, something strange happens, which we should try and see on a picture. Now I'll do a little graph, graph here. This is gonna be, this time it's not time. This is gonna be the lambda axis. So I'm gonna capture different values of lambda, the fertility on this axis, but this is still gonna be population between zero and one. I'm gonna mark this at four uh, and this is one. So this is the behavior after it's settled down. So between zero and one, it turns out that if you pick lambda between zero and one, eventually things die. As you, as you nicely exemplified, you killed all the rabbits because they're not fertile enough. So after you've pressed equals thousands of times, we're gonna plot what happens. So this is the death zone. This is the death zone, yeah. Well, maybe we should write death here because uh, over time, the population stabilizes at zero. You chose 0.6 something and it was in the death zone, so this was kind of your point here. When we did it earlier, we chose 2.3 here, uh, which is about here, but it stabilized to be about 0.56, I think it was 0.565 when we did it, so it's kind of just over half. So there's a mark on our graph here. And if you do this, um, and you could plot this on a spreadsheet if you wanted to, you see that the stability changes in this sort of pattern. 
in that different values of fertility give you different stable populations. Um, interestingly, it sort of levels off at about two thirds. It looks like you can't have a stable population that's fuller than that, according to this model. But you've already seen that something interesting happens. We tried 3.2, uh, I think, earlier. So 3.2 gave us a two cycle, which means over a long time, we're gonna have two marks on this graph. And so I'm just gonna sort of estimate that they're about here and here. And the graph, if you plot it, bifurcates, which is a posh way of saying it forks. Like they call it a pitchfork bifurcation. And so this is, uh, we've got dead, we've got stable, and then from about three, we get a two cycle. But we will have also seen that at 3.5, it settled into a four cycle. So then you can kind of guess what's gonna happen. If I put the four on, they, they happen to be around here, and you can see that somewhere it splits. And it bifurcates again, or it forks again. The, the posh word for this is, is the period um, of these cycles, this is a one cycle because it's got one value. This is a two cycle, the period is two. And then it goes to four. And they call this a period doubling thing. What's intriguing is that by picking certain values of lambda, you can get any period you want, as long as it's a power of two, because it doubles every time. So if you want a 16 cycle, there is a value of lambda. I'll let you go and find it. It's not much higher than what we used at 3.5 because come and have a look at this graph again. The graph doubles again and again, and again, and again, and quicker, and quicker, and quicker. So a tiny change in this lambda gives you a new branch. And it gets insane. It gets, it gets so that you can't make any change even to the accuracy of your calculator and expect to notice the difference, but massively different behavior is happening. And if you recognize this sort of thing, this, is, this was being studied before the word chaos was used, but we now understand technically the word chaos, apart from just being a mess. It means technically something which is really sensitive to initial conditions. So this is a good example. A tiny change in our lambda gave you massively different behavior. And from a modeling point of view for rabbits, this stops getting useful because it becomes very hard to predict what's gonna happen with a certain value of lambda. But there is a final twist. Before we get to a final twist, which is what happens to that graph further to the right, uh, Mitchell Feigenbaum got involved in this at this point in the 70s. And he was looking at this thinking this is it's surprising that a simple function does an interesting thing like this. And he started to study how quickly this doubling happened. So that, that took a, a, a little gap. And this took a shorter gap. And this takes a shorter gap again, because it's going quicker and quicker. And he thought it'd be, it'd be interesting to know if this is a sort of regular scaling thing. He didn't think it would be, because it's doing crazy stuff. But he started dividing one of the, these regions. So like if you divide that width by that width, and then that one by the previous one, just to see the ratio. And he got this number, Feigenbaum's constant it's called now, 4.669. Now, in itself, it's quite amazing this has a nice regular behavior. What it's saying is that this gap is about 4.6 times smaller than the previous gap. So the period doubling is getting quicker and quicker. It's a geometric series, in fact. If you multiply that by one over 4.669, you roughly get this one. And if you keep going, he managed to prove that this is the ratio it's tending towards. But he doesn't know what this number is, and still no one knows actually what this number is. We don't, we don't have a, a closed form of explaining what this number is. What is genuinely shocking is that he then looks at some other equations. Forget biology now, he just looked at other quadratic equations. If you haven't spotted already, I'm just gonna point it out. This equation here is a quadratic because it has an x times an x. He looked at all sorts of other functions, all of them having a single sort of hump, and this is a quadratic map with a, a single hump. And he found that every function he looked at not only exhibited this period doubling, if you started fiddling with the parameter, but it also scaled with that number. And it turns out now this is called Feigenbaum's constant because every unimodal map or quadratic map scales like this. And, and no one knows what this number is or why <laughs> things are behaving like this, but it seems to describe a whole raft of things which no one had ever looked at before. And that, there was this concept of universality that even different situations are still captured by this number. So I'm gonna recreate the diagram we had earlier on paper. Um, I, I'm just gonna start that here. So that we've got our um, lambda along here, and this little red dot, which is now tracking across. We're in the dead zone here. This is, this is where population is dead, uh, but after one, you can see it spikes up. So this is a stable population now. And uh, it's gonna go all the way to three before it does. You, can, you remember what happens, it's gonna split, bifurcate at three. So that's our two cycle. Uh, and then I told you that it does something around about 3.4, just a little bit afterwards, I'll show you that now, splits again. That's our second bifurcation but you know it's gonna get quicker and quicker. This is what Feigenbaum found. So after this, it's gonna period double very, very, very quickly. But actually at a point which is about 3.59, uh, it's not very far away, you can prove the period doubling must stop at that point. 
because that would be like the, the, if you add a geometric series up to infinity, there, there's a limit. And so the, the prediction doesn't tell you what happens after that point. Uh, but you can see it. We can go beyond infinity right now. So at 3.6, the period doubling is going to stop and something else is going to take over. And just have a little watch of this. So there's a very strange behavior. It's, it's nice and simple and then uh, crazy. Uh, and actually, this is a good example of chaos as well. I'm going to zoom in on that region. So here's the, the two cycle, and then it's split again to a four cycle, and then eight, and then 16. And then right there, we've gone in what they call the onset of chaos. And it's a technical term, chaos meaning really sensitive. But it's, it's, it's almost beautiful. There's weird structure happening here. This is not a glitch in my software. And yet, it looks like for most of it, it's spitting out random. So these are the populations. Every time you press equals, it's creating a dot. Does this get crazier then, like the Mandelbrot set? You're right to spot that. The Mandelbrot set is involved with this. This is a fractal. Um, if you zoom in on stuff, uh, so if I zoomed in on this period doubling bit, you can see more period doubling is self-similar. But then the self-similarity seems to sort of go a bit crazy. Actually, this is the Mandelbrot set, but you're only seeing one dimension of it. The Mandelbrot set, as you may know, is all about using complex numbers. You need two-dimensional numbers. If you just looked at the central line of the Mandelbrot set and plotted what the points do when you do the iteration, this is what you're seeing. And actually, this was, this was happening at the same time as Benoit Mandelbrot was discovering about the beginnings of fractals and chaos. So this is all tied together. What's lovely about it is that even in chaos, you get order turning up. So this here is a three cycle. It's going crazy over here, and then suddenly it settles down to stable behavior, three cycle. In fact, it doubles to a, uh, you get six, and then you get 12, but then it goes back to chaos again. And nobody expected this behavior to happen from a really simple equation. It's just the same equation we've been using all along. And it was the beginning of chaos theory, what they call nonlinear dynamics now, where, where t simple deterministic equations have very unpredictable results. And one massive application for it is if you want a computer to generate a random number, you can't. Like, you tell a computer to pick something random and it goes, uh, seven? No, it doesn't have a uh, function like we do, uh, although we always pick seven, it seems. But if you wanted a computer to spit out a random number, you have to pretend, you have to tell it what to do because it's a computer. But what you could do is tell it to use this function, press equals a few times near the end of our diagram, and it would spit out a number which appears to be random. They call them pseudo-random numbers. But this formula was one of the first ones they ever used to make what we now call pseudo-random numbers. If you've enjoyed this video, you might be the sort of person who would like The Great Courses Plus. This is a huge on-demand video library starring the best lecturers and teachers from around the world. Joining up gives you unlimited access to this vast library of really in-depth, meaty courses about all sorts of things, including some brilliant ones about mathematics and, for example, this one all about fractals. But whatever your passion or interest, the Great Courses Plus is going to have something, probably many things, up your alley. Just lately I've been watching this particular video all about the early days of aviation because, well, I love anything to do with planes. To have a look, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash number file. The link's there on the screen and there's also a link in the video description you can just click on. Using the link will give you a free one month trial with total access to the whole archive. So why not give them a look? It's a way of showing a bit of support for number file, but also a chance to do some serious binge learning. You... Oi, what are you doing? Hello, Audrey. What are you doing? Audrey. You got you heard about chaos and thought that'd be exciting, yeah? Oh, cutie. You're delightful. Come on, out we go. Out, out. <laughs>